and welcome everybody to Bookends Online Edition, produced by the Wadena County Historical Society and Traveling Story Seller in collaboration with New York Mills Regional Cultural Center. Bookends is made possible by the voters of Minnesota through a grant from the Five Wings Arts Council, thanks to a legislative appropriation from the Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund. Bookends programs from previous authors are now available on the website of the Wadena County Historical Society at www.wadenacountyhistory.org. Today's program will also be available on the website shortly. Next month's bookends will be held live Saturday, August 13th, 2020 at 11.30 at the Uptown Cafe Wadena and will feature the poetry of Freya Manfred and her book, Loon in Late November Water. This month, local author Julie Jo Larson, oh, sorry, Julie Jo Larson's own wanderlust led her to share her penchant for her region in her recent book, 100 Things to Do in Minnesota Northwoods Before You Die. Whether you use it as a tour guide, a bucket list, or a cure for cabin fever, this book is sure to provide plenty of inspiration for you to visit the Minnesota Northwoods. If you have questions for today's author, feel free to enter them through chat. Now, everybody, let's welcome to Bookends Online Edition, Julie Jo Larson. Welcome. Hi, thank you so much. Oh my gosh, I'm in the neatest building imaginable in downtown Wadena. It, it has been, uh, it was a hotel and it's been changed into these beautiful apartments with lovely tin ceilings. It is so cool, but I'm so excited to be here. <laughs> So yeah, in um, we've got a PowerPoint loading right now as we speak, and it'll take a second for it to load. Um, so yeah, I wrote a book called 100 Things to Do in Minnesota Northwoods Before You Die. And I'm just seeing if I can get PowerPoint to, there we go. Here's a little bit of an overview of our presentation. Um, I always like to give people an idea of what we're gonna be talking about. Please, if you have any questions or if you have suggestions of places that I need to check out in the Wadena area, please enter it in the chat. So I'll give you a little bit of uh, information about me, um, a little bit about how this strange project came to be through the time of COVID. And then I'll share a few um, places of interest, and then some announcements for 2023, and of course, more question time. So I'm going to move this over. Um, you can see the PowerPoint okay, right? Great. So I didn't plan on writing a travel guide during COVID, but I had this great opportunity. Um, I met a lot of neat people when I moved to Brainerd in 2007. Um, and one of them just happened to be Krista Sukup from the um, Blue Cottage Agency. And Krista forwarded me this crazy little email and it had just two sentences and we'll uh, get to that on the next slide. This is a picture kind of that summarizes who I am and what I am. In the bottom left, you see a picture with four girls, four women. The only thing we have common is that we all went to the same church and we all really, really loved history and just looking at neat buildings. Those four um, together, we are called the Mistorians. Oh, and I'm, <laughs> yeah, the Mistorians. And we run around and we tour cemeteries and old buildings. Um, and we, we just get into a little bit of mischief. We're not much for gossip, but we're great for history and facts. Um, the one gal with the yellow shirt, she passed away about a year ago from cancer. So um, we're one, one or two people short right now. Um, in the upper middle of the screen, there's a little tombstone. And what that is, is it says Joseph Henry, Company D of the USCI 125th. And that is Joseph Henry from the 125th Colored Infantry. Joseph is buried on the north shores of Mille Lacs Lake in a tiny little cemetery in the middle of nowhere. And he was one of my favorite articles that I wrote for the Lake Country Journal. 
Um, in the late 1800s, Joseph and a, a handful of other Civil War veterans from the South moved up to the shores um, of, of Mille Lacs Lake. Part of the contingency ended up in Fergus Falls and part of them ended up over by Wealthwood. Uh, you see a picture of my family and I was just sharing with Lena that my husband, Stephen grew up, his early days was in Eagle Bend. So he remembers coming to Wadena thinking that it was this big, huge city with big buildings. It's just all <laughs> in perspective. We have three adult children. And a lot of what I'm going to show you today um, is from adventures we had with our kids. When our three children were little, we did not buy them Game Boys and Nintendos. We took them on adventures and traveled with them. By nature, I'm a licensed social worker. During the day, I work at Central Lakes College as the assistant director of a program that helps first generation college students finish degrees. And on nights and weekends, I do my writing. This is a lovely picture I just took last weekend. I snuck away for the weekend and went up to Thunder Bay. And just north of Duluth, there are, oh my gosh, the lupines are just fields and fields of them and it's so much fun. But like I mentioned, Krista Sukup from the Blue Cottage Agency is a friend of mine. Um, I got to know her through a lot of writing workshops. Krista sent me an email and it had just a couple sentences. It said, is your daughter still working at Safari North Wildlife Park? If she is, what does she think of the Tiger King? And would you be interested in writing a book? Now imagine just being told in your day job that you're gonna have to go home and telework for an indefinite amount of time. You have to learn all this computer stuff, all the Zoom and the Googles and everything else. And then someone says, hey, let me distract you for a couple months. Well, I told Krista, sure, why not? And she put me in contact with Reedy Press out of St. Louis, Missouri. And they're a company that writes a lot of these 100 things. They've got most of their books are for a city, like 100 Things to Do in St. Louis or Savannah, Georgia. Um, but there's just a couple of them that they allowed to do regional, and I'm fortunate that they allowed me to do the Minnesota Northwoods as a regional. I signed my contract in May of 2020, and um, the, you know, the book, or March of 2020, and the book was due in October. So it's about just over a year, year and a half old. It came out in April of 2021. Um, is it a travel book, a bucket list, a cure for cabin fever? I let the reader decide because everyone's using it differently right now. So the fun part was actually being able to do research during the time of COVID. We of course used our masks and we were really, really careful, but because I'd written a lot of articles for the Lake Country Journal, I was able to draw back on my files for that. In the upper left part of the screen, um, you see a gentleman who turned 100, just as the article I wrote about the Milford mine disaster um, opened up. And I'm sorry, but um, he passed away just before he was able to read it. He um, passed away with cancer. But I used a lot of my research, like I said. Um, I also did about 6,000 miles on my little Subaru traveling. And I went up to the headwaters of Itasca um, State Park where the Mississippi River begins. It was a beautiful day. The water was still really, really cold when my friend and I went up. Um, the original list of um, items I wanted to put in this book were about 140. And what I did is I put them on a really big sheet of tag board and I divided them up into the categories of the book. We don't get to choose what the categories are because Reedy Press has this great format they use. But we'll go over some of the categories in just a minute. Research also included attending a lot of writing workshops um, to hone in on my craft of writing. Like I said, I work full time during the day as a social worker um, and I really wanted to make sure that my writing was good. 
Despite all the travel I do, I really am an introvert. When I get home at night, I like to sit down with my chickens and my dog and just kind of crash. Well, if you can see this slide, this slide is of the High Falls in Grand Portage. My book goes all the way to the Canadian border. And on the southern edge, I um, went to the Palmer House and Sock Center. That's kind of what I considered the North was I tried to think where do we find the most pine trees and that's the area that I wrote of. Of course it's impossible to include every community when you're only allowed 100 entries and each entry is only about 120 words so you really don't get a lot of um, a lot of space. I can give you an indication of what one of the Oh, let's do number 57. One of the entries is, and it goes along with the picture that you're seeing right now. That's the high falls just from last weekend. And the water really is still coming over um, and roaring. Number 57 in the book starts out by walk up to the high falls at Grand Portage State Park. Minnesota might be home to dozens of waterfalls, but none can compare to the high falls at Grand Portage State Park. Reaching a height of 120 feet, the Pigeon River plunges down with a mighty roar. Three viewing decks give ample opportunity to photograph the falls or meditate in awe. I found the middle falls quite stunning and especially enjoyed the view of Lake Superior from the park's highest point. If you choose to hike, to the middle falls, wear good walking shoes and bring a water bottle. Also the five mile hike can be challenging in the heat of August. Boy, I learned that one. <laughs> you will need a Minnesota State Park sticker to enter the park. And each entry has the name of the thing, phone numbers, websites and information like that. And occasionally I was able to put a tip in. And the tip for this entry said, the Pigeon River and the High Falls are shared between the United States and Canada. Cross the border and view the falls from the Canadian side for a different perspective. And I've actually done that. Of course, to get into Canada, you need an enhanced driver's license, a passport or a pass card, but it's well worth it to see the beautiful falls from two sides. So this is so much fun. So like I explained, the book is actually divided into sections that are predetermined. The first section is food and beverage. And this was crazy to research during COVID because a lot of places were closed down. Um, on the top, you see Russ, Russ Kendall's smokehouse. That's the oldest smokehouse still on the North shore. That's located by Knife River. Um, it's just really a lot of fish, fresh, fresh fish and cheese curds. And off to the left, there's this little door. Um, it was closed when I was there last weekend, but there's a little door where you used to be able to go and eat your fishing crackers and things like that. On the bottom is the most delicious pizza I've ever had. It's in a small community called Moose Lake. And the name of the business is Poor Gary's. And that is chicken wild rice pizza. You know, I can't think of a grain that says Minnesota Northwoods more than wild rice. Here they take like a white Alfredo sauce and they put the cheese and the chicken and the wild rice and it's just a really good amount of flavors. The top right, you see Lewis the dog. Lewis was a puppy when we were out exploring. And my photographer, Vicki Foss, and I fell in love with Lewis. He was so cute. He was at the Roundhouse Brewery. Um, at the time, they were located in the Northern Pacific Center in Brainerd, and now they're up in Nisswa. But small craft beers really have become a big thing in the uh, Northwoods, as have distilleries. In the bottom is chocolate, which I absolutely love my chocolate. That's Fancy Pants Chocolate, um, and it's located in downtown Brainerd. I have a 
another reading I'm going to do for you quick. Oh, let's do this fun one. So number 18 in the book, it's in the food and beverage part, and it's a little Minnesota Northwoods humor. It says, eat lutefisk at a Lutheran church. Minnesota Northwoods is home for many Scandinavians, a hearty culture that thrives on food from both land and water. One of their most noted dis dishes is lutefisk. It's a Lutheran church Christmas tradition along with lefsa. Most people have tried lefsa, but what is lutefisk? Church ladies and men spend over a week carefully soaking white fish in rotations of cold water and lime. Once cooked and salted, lutefisk becomes semi-translucent semi and gelatinous. It's one of those foods you try once just to say you did, or you try it and you love it. There's no in-between with lutefisk. To find a Lutheran church serving lutefisk, check the local newspapers in December or ask the locals when you're out and about. Questioning if lutefisk is for you, take heart. Meatballs are often paired with these suppers. Even picky eaters love meatballs. And once again, there's a small tip at the bottom of this one. And it says, old Lutheran churches are well preserved in the Northwoods. Their stained glass windows glow at dusk and dawn. Try to arrive early enough to watch the sun set through these 100 year old treasures. And there are so many beautiful churches in the North Woods with those stained glass windows. Music and entertainment is the next um, category in the book. And this was the most difficult to do during times of COVID. When so many things were closed down, um, there are a few places that were really creative. In the bottom left, you see a picture, or I'm sorry, the bottom right, you see a picture of a performance that the Central Lakes College Community Theater put on the first summer when everything was shut down. It's called the Wonderful Wonderettes. They had a huge stage outside right on the backyard of the college. Um, they took big hoops and made circles eight feet apart and the circles were big enough for two to four lawn chairs. And we had all kinds of beautiful sound system and things. So we still in Brainerd, we still had our theater. It was a little bit different, but it was still there. Other things that were included were the small, tiny lake theater in Moose Lake. This is a theater that's five generations and is still owned by the same family. On the billboard, you see it says Ghostbusters. And it kind of makes me laugh because that was the first movie my husband and I went to on our date in 1984. Ghostbusters had just opened up. I laughed so hard. I think it was probably the movie more than him that, you know, united the two of us. But that Ghostbuster billboard and the poster on the door stayed there all the way through the summer of 2020 into the spring of 2021. Like I said, some places were able to open up and some weren't. The music and entertainment also includes the beautiful Duluth Harbor. Many times when I go there, there's someone playing saxophone or violin or trumpet. Um, one day I walked the boardwalk and there was a guy with an accordion and it felt just like being home in New Orleans again. <laughs> So the third section of the book is sports and recreation. And again, this was another tough subject to research and take pictures of during COVID. I was fortunate though, because our children and us did so much traveling in the Northwoods. And the upper left is my husband, Stephen, and our youngest when she was really, really little. Hawk Ridge Nature Preserve. One thing we really loved about Hawk Ridge is that you could actually, um, for a small fee, you could hold a hawk and release it out into the open. And Morgan did it. She just loved it. It was the neatest thing in the world. At the time, I told her, no way am I going to touch a bird. Well, in March of 2020, Morgan came up to me with the idea and said, Mom, 
I want to get you chickens for your birthday so they can eat the ticks in the backyard. And I agreed to it. You'll see a picture of the newest chicks in a little bit, but I went from hating birds to really loving these chickens. <laughs> yeah, it is. A, they're just fun. There is a season for everything. And although people argue with me all the time, Minnesota does have four seasons. Even up north here, we do. We love our summers. You either love or you tolerate winters. And then there's a couple muddy seasons in between with spring and fall, but we love traveling. And you can see I also included um, some bait and tackle shops. The JC ice fishing extravaganza is the biggest in Minnesota and probably in all of North America and a lot of bird watching. I would have been amiss if I hadn't discussed our many state parks in Minnesota. Even people who don't like going outside enjoy the history of our state parks. The big tree on the right comes from the Lost 40 natural um, protected land. Um, and I'll read something of it in a little bit. And the upper right is my middle daughter. Every place we traveled, it seemed that they had these little cutouts where you're supposed to put your little hole in and then take a picture of yourself. Well, my daughter got her shepherd husky to stick um, Arwen's head through there. And Serena had her picture and her boyfriend snapped it quick. Most communities have these little cutouts. They're so much fun for the kids, but they're a lot of fun for us adults too. Why not try something new? There are so many hiking trails and biking trails. So culture and history, I have to admit, this is my favorite subject. I um, just finished my term on the um, Crow Wing County Historical Society Board where I served two terms. I've been a part of the Moose Lake Historical Society and I've been in many, many different historical societies through the state. History is alive and really, really well in the Northwoods. On the bottom right, you see this beautiful mural. And this is on the back side um, in Sock Center. It is, it is phenomenal. Um, huge, lifelike Sinclair Lewis. Um, let me see if I've got. I just want to make sure I have the right direction in it. Okay, so instead of number 76, I'm going to read number 13 for you out of the book. And it's kind of a play on numbers. So 13 is supposed to be the big spooky number. Number 13 in the book is um, centered around the Palmer House Hotel. And it says, eat with unregistered guests at the Palmer House Hotel, restaurant, and pub. Kelly Freezy puts her guests into two categories, registered and unregistered. The difference, the registered guests pay for their meals and the unregistered don't because they are no longer living. The Palmer House Hotel, restaurant, and pub is included in the most haunted in Minnesota list. Care 11, Minnesota Monthly, even TripAdvisor ranks the Palmer House as a top spot for paranormal activity. Also a top notch place to eat. For lunch, I prefer the Hawaiian chicken salad with Palmer's homemade poppy seed dressing. I encourage you to start your dinner with a seasonal chicken wild rice salad, again, the favorite grain, followed by a hand cut ribeye. Ask the bar manager for the evening drink special. Be moderate and don't blink or the dapple, dapper fellow by the bar might disappear as quick as your sweet potato fries. It is, I've been there maybe six nights I've spent at the Palmer and I've never had anything strange happen. I did take advantage of the tip. If meeting unregistered guests sounds like fun to you, sign up for one of Kelly's after hour tours. And they actually have these little paranormal groups that come and 
and um, do these little presentations and you go in the basement, which is really dark and spooky and cool. And, and you go up in the, all the parts of it. It's really, really fun, but I've never had anything happen. The last time I spent the night, I stayed with my friend um, Yvonne and we came out of the room and the next morning, these gals were coming out of the room next to us and they're, they're like, well, what were you doing? Our bedroom wall was shaking and everything was jolting. And I said, we slept like a rock. We didn't do anything. Um, apparently on their side of the wall, things were happening. So maybe the next time I'm at the Palmer, I don't know. I'm not, I just don't pick up on things like that, but it is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful place. Um, other things in, that you see on the screen right now in the upper left is Paul Bunyan. He is one of the three famous figures that Minnesota has. Up north, he's our most famous. The second close is, of course, Bigfoot. And then in southern Minnesota by Lesueur is the Jolly Green Giant. So we've got a lot of big, strong men. We do have beautiful women um, um, characters, too. Um, one of my favorite is Lucette, this massive massive woman, um, Paul Bunyan's girlfriend or wife, depending on who you talk to. And she is in um, Hackensack. Well, there's a lot more city and um, county historical societies that we can't even touch on. And the upper left is the graduating class from Aiken High School. And I think this was probably about 19... 53. And there we see Miss Ava Ware. She was one of the last of the Black community that resided on the North Shores of Mille Lacs Lake. Um, she went on to be um, an activist and a prominent figure. Um, Rudy Perpich recognized her one year. I believe she passed away in Minnesota in the Twin Cities, but she always remembered growing up in the Northwoods. We have a miner's hat, which was really, really a lot of fun to research. Let me see if I can find that here. So the miner's hat goes along with number 76 in the book. It says, reflect at the Milford Mine Memorial Park. Minnesota's worst mining accident occurred at the Milford Mine on February 5th, 1924. 41 miners lost their lives and became encased in mud and water after the mine shaft collapsed. Seven miners made it out that fateful day. The park has excellent signage explaining the ruins that are still on the site. The tragic story of the Milford Mine disaster is told through kiosks a memorial bridge, and a lot of photographs. Visitors are encouraged to walk slowly and read all of the displays. The park is a day destination for hikers, bikers, and historians. Walking paths, picnic shelters, cooking grills, and bike racks were part of the ongoing upgrades. I encourage visitors to wear comfortable shoes, old shoes, because the red iron lace soil at the park will stain lighter colors. And if you've ever been up on um, that part, that orange soil doesn't come out of shoes, pants, um, and it's hard to get off your skin right away. The tip is to stop by the Sioux Line Depot Museum on 101 First Street Northeast in Crosby to view a large selection of artifacts and more photos from those days. Each historical society has their little gem or their nugget of something fun to do. In the Crow Wing County Historical Society, it's in the old sheriff quarters and there's actually a women's jail cell. When they open up the sheriff's quarters, you can go in and you can try to sit on the stainless steel commode, which is freezing. And you can try to lay on their little teeny cot. I can't imagine anyone sleeping any amount of time 
but it is nice to see what things looked like at the turn of the century. Shopping and fashion is the last part of the book. It's my hardest. I'm not a fashionista, but I do love visiting small businesses. Small businesses are the heartbeat of any community in the Northwoods. Why? They're the ones that when we go around and our sons and daughters need a, you know, some kind of drawing gift for a church or for a sport they're in, or even for their school, it's our small businesses that contribute. It's the small businesses that are helping us keep going through COVID. And in return, I like supporting our small businesses. One of the items in the book, and I'm gonna see if this is it. Yep, it is. So you see there's two boots and those are actually called mukluks and they're made in Ely, Minnesota. I'm on my third pair. These are my daughters with their first pair that I bought the year before COVID hit. But number 86 says, warm your toes with Steger mukluks and moccasins. A familiar phrase in these parts is that Minnesota Northwoods has two seasons, winter and road construction, both lasting about six months. So excellent winter footwear, uh, footwear is a necessity both for survival and outdoor winter enjoyment. The warmest boots in Minnesota and actually in the world are probably made at Ely, Steger, Mukluk and Moccasins. Will Steger wore a pair of Arctic Mukluks on his Arctic expeditions and his feet stayed warm and dry. People as far away as Norway agree with Will that these boots really are the best. I personally love my Steger mukluks. They're stylish and perfect for all day wear. The Steger retail store also sells Chaco sandals, comfortable and stylish clothing, books, accessories, and Icelandic wool jackets, which are another necessity up north. The staff are friendly and patient, and they'll help you find the perfect pair of mukluks for your winter activity. The only thing I don't like about my mukluks is that obviously I can't wear them in the um, in the summer heat like we have right now. So I have to settle for Crocs and sandals and things like that. In the book, I was able to include as a thing um, wandering for, through Walker, Minnesota. And Walker, Minnesota has just a host of small shops, probably about three blocks of it. Everything from um, sunflower oil to um, fishing equipment and things like that. But what I encourage people to do is why not just wander through a store because it's there? You never know when you'll see a beautiful tin ceiling or you'll come across original marble um, baseboards and things like that. So now is a great time. I can't see the um, box, but if you have any questions, please put them in. On the upper left, you see there are actually three books from Reedy Press, um, and there will be a fourth one next spring when I release 100 Things to Do in Minnesota, as in all of Minnesota, before you die. Um, the picture on the upper right is of my friend Devon, who passed away, like I said, last June. She's actually um, the mother of my daughter's um, high school sweetheart. They got married about 10 days before Yvonne passed away. And every time I look at Lake Superior, I remember how much she loved the lake and things like that. Um, in the bottom is a map of Minnesota. Last year, I put on over 6,000 miles. And I know, oh yeah, it was great. I know I'll hit that easily. Um, by September 1st, because I'm getting really close to that right now. But of course, when you're writing a book, you have to, you have to go north, you have to go south. I'm sorry to say that I did not make it to Angle Township. Um, I ended up getting COVID the week that we were supposed to go north there. Um, but I'll still include Angle Township. There's only two ways to get to Angle Township, and that's the little chimney of Minnesota. You're either going to take a boat and you're going to boat across to it, or 
you'll go into Canada and then come down the chimney. And if you're going to do that, you might as well just go back up into Canada and go to Thunder Bay where you can pick amethyst and you know get to see our good neighbors to the north. On the bottom, this is the picture of my newest motley crew of chickens. Yep, I'm a chicken mama. The yellow one is named Golden Fingers because when I got them, my husband was on this big kick to watch all these James Bond movies. And all the other chicks have fur on their feet, but Gold Fingers just has these big yellow toes. Um, next to Gold Fingers, it's hard to see, but that's a little bird called Sparrow. And it sounds just like a little sparrow. We've got the big brute in front with kind of this little mohawk going. I don't think it's a hen. I think that one's gonna end up being a rooster, but that one's name is Binks, just like the black cat from the Halloween show. And in the very, very back, that's Pip. Pip is about two days younger than these three, but quite a bit smaller. I love my chickens and I include them because when I'm writing, a lot of times my first draft is by hand and I'm sitting outside with the chickens. Um, the, the yellow chicken is supposed to be a Rhode Island red. I think it's an Americana. I don't think it's a Rhode Island red. And the other three are actually silky. So they're gonna be small like a bowling ball and just really, really fuzzy. Um, it was a lot of fun to write the book, to share places. Like I said, obviously I couldn't get to every community and with only 100 things, um, it was pretty hard to, uh, to narrow the list down. Sometimes in the book I was able to link. So um, we talked about poor Gary pizza in Moose Lake. I encourage people to go grab a pizza from poor Gary's and then go sit on the outside patio of the Moose Lake Brewing Company, where you can look across the beautiful Moosehead Lake and you can watch the loons come in and the skiers and the boaters. And then when you get tired of that, you can go to that little lake theater, which really just is small. It's got one screen, but it's been upgraded. It's got air conditioning and great popcorn. So you can tie in multiple things for the area. It's a lot of fun just seeing what's out and about there. In the back of the book, there are itineraries based off of season. Um, and then um, I've got a little uh, heading that talks about eerie stops because some people like that spooky ghosty things. Scenic Highway 61. There's a little section that talks about what do you do on a rainy day? And my gosh, whether you've got kids or grandkids or just a crabby husband, when it's been raining up here for a few days, we all need to get out. But that's included in the back of the book. Sure. Shelly, that's a question. Good. All right, Shelly. All right. Hold on. All right, one of our, uh, well, Gillette was wondering, because um, she does some writing stuff herself, um, she was wondering if you participated in flash writing exercises to hone your skills to write, because I know from my own experience too, when you can write like forever, it's easy, but when you've got like 120 words, you're like. <laughs> yeah, it's really, really hard. I'm fortunate that in 2010, I was able to go back to college and finish my AA. Um, and I had a wonderful English teachers at Central Lakes College. Um, and some of the things they did is they made us do flash writing. They made us do one paragraph. Um, and then of course we also had those 20 page papers to do too. So, <laughs> but still it was really, really hard to get it down to about 120 words because you can only give people a taste of, you know, where I want them to go and explore. Um, I can't give them too much information. And yet if you don't give them enough, they'll turn the page and you know never visit that place. Hey, hey um, do you belong to a writer's group? I belong to the writers, um, 
Lake City Writers Alliance. It used to be the Brainerd Writers Alliance. And I'm also part of a small group, um, um, Candy Simar and a bunch of uh, writers from the Brainerd Lakes area, actually from across the country because we have a participant from New Mexico. We go to St. Benedict's um, the first week of August. And we have Sheila O'Connor, who's a writing instructor from Hamlin University. Sheila comes over and she gives us um, assignments and lectures and workshops. And for a whole, whole week, this very small group of women get together and we live there, we eat there, we play there. It's just phenomenal. Um, it started off by invitation only, and I don't think we've lost a single person in seven years. So cool. yeah, it's a great group. We write during the day and then at night we take turns reading. Um, if you can, if you're interested in writing, uh, publishing a book or an article, um, joining a writer's group is a great way to improve your craft and have a lot of fun. Cool. And I'm sure that it's great for having encouragement and other writers to talk to. It is. And we all write some, um, like one gal writes romance and another gal writes historical fiction from the 1850s. Um, everyone's got their own little niche. So it never seems like we're in competition with one another. Right. Uh, this year, we did something different. Last year, we met in the summer at someone's house because of COVID. We didn't want to um, get together in a small area. And we were joking about all of the cozy mysteries that were, you know, coming out and how that was the big craze. And we had this great idea that we were going to write our own cozy mystery. <laughs> and we did. What happened is each person was assigned a month. So the first person wrote the first chapter, and then the second person wrote a chapter, and the third all the way through number, um, I think there were 12 of us there. I was number 11. I had the benefit. I could read what everybody else wrote before me. In the book, we killed off Krista Suka, our marketing person. But you have to wait till the very end of the book um, to figure out who did it. Um, none of us know except the person that wrote that last chapter. So when we go in August, each of us will take a turn reading our chapter and patiently wait until the last chapter is read to see who killed Krista. But it was a lot of fun. Cool. Have you personally thought of um, writing other types of genres beyond travel or writing like something like like a chapter book rather than like small blurbs on different places, but like pick something and go deep or just a general musing on travel or on fiction or any other type of book. I mean, not that these aren't great. Yeah, I'm just... I, I have. Oh yeah. I mean, there's so much out there you can do. I actually yeah. didn't start to write um, travel. I started um, a book, a novel, um, historical fiction based off of that black cemetery on the North Shores of Malax Lake. And I did have a Five Wings Art Council grant um, that helped me along on that quite a bit. Um, the book is sitting on my shelf. It's not it's still percolating. And then there's oh. another one that's more memoir based um, that should be one next Minnesota book is done. I'll have to focus more on one of those. But these just kind of came back to back. In December, I received an email from Reedy Press, just again, two sentences. Hey, we're, we've been talking. Do you want to write a, um, the 100 things to do in Minnesota before you die? So uh, it was New Year's Eve day, and I signed that contract, which meant any other writing that I had started is on the back burner again. But it'll come out. I'm, I've got about, I don't know, seven years before I retire. And once I retire, I plan on writing full time. So it's cool. just fitting it all in. Yeah. Yeah, it's always hard to get everything you need to do into a day. <laughs> Where's your favorite place to go? Um, in like on vacation or if you were like staying in Minnesota, but you wanted to get away, where's your favorite place? 
Well, it's kind of like asking someone who their favorite kid is. Um, oh, my mother. I do yeah, believe sorry, my favorite. Oh, no, I said it's it's kind of like asking someone who their favorite child is. You know, it's it's yeah. hard to pick just one thing. My favorite place in Minnesota is our family cabin on the shores of Sand Lake near Moose Lake. But my favorite travel place, without a doubt now, is the High Falls. Um, just because it's a spectacular view. And it leads me right straight across the border. Like I said, I love going to Thunder Bay and picking amethyst and mining amethyst. And once I look at the high falls, I know I'm about an hour away from my amethyst pile. So <laughs> yeah, more outdoorsy. Cool, cool. Yeah, shopping isn't really my big thing, but there are a lot of neat places to go. Yeah, I like walking. I like small towns with all the independent stores and you just wander in and some of them have stuff you might never think to need or want, but it's just fun to go and look. It is. And say and each, hi. Well, and to say hi and you walk in and you talk to the, the cashier and they'll tell you the best place to get a hot coffee or a lunch sandwich. Um, you know, and, and they'll tell you the history of all these great old buildings. So you learn a lot by going in these little stores. Oh. I wanted to comment on this book. It, it seems to be exceptionally well made because it has held up. It looks like every page has been really well thumbed, and yet it's not falling apart. It's not falling <laughs> apart. So what I, I see no, no duct tape on it anywhere. Well, there's actually the cover was laminated. Oh, so I, I okay. took some clear shelving and I I covered the both the front and the back cover. The book does hold together pretty well. I don't know if you can see it, but in my book, there's actually writing. So every time I go back to one of these places, I write in what I did and if it's a food place, what did yeah. I eat? Cool. Um, other people have taken the book and they've had um, waitresses sign it. Um, cool. it. It just kind of sees. It's the perfect size, though, for the, like, I've got a little purse that I put mine in. But it also fits really, really well in the pockets of your seats and right between by the driver's console. So I've always got my copy with me. And, you know, if my husband and I need something to do, we kind of open it up and we just we just pick a direction and we go there for the day. Cool. Um, is there any locations in Wadena County in the book? In this one, there's not, but there will be in all of Minnesota. I think the closest to Wadena County probably is, um, hmm, now let me think. It's probably the Palmer House is probably the closest over here. Although I do have the Concordia Moorhead um, um, choir in it because their Christmas concert is probably the, the most famous um college concert in minnesota but yeah the next book will definitely have wadena um area <laughs> in it um it has the sculpture gardens by vinland um and there's a couple other inspiration peak you know i've tried to get to communities that i don't have in the first book but that one like i said covers all of minnesota from corner to corner so um it, it, it's it's tough, you know, making sure I get a little bit of everywhere. All right. Yeah, because actually, I don't think it. Gillette Atascus isn't too far away, right? We've been there. I would go up and visit Gillette when she was living there, and we would go to places. So we went to Atascus in the Hidden Forty, I think. Yes, we did. Yes, we did. We did both those things. Uh, Atasca is about two hours north of Wadena. And I think the Lost 40 is also about a two Okay. And then did you go to pass these bus in Grand, is it Grand Rapids or Park Rapids? Pasties is like a mining food. It's like um, a crust and they've got rutabaga in it. And the one that I love has sauerkraut. Oh yeah, you know what? Yeah. <laughs> 
No, we haven't had pasties. We've had poutine. Poutine <laughs> burger Hitkers in Duluth. Um, the restaurant and brew house area, um, mm -hmm. but it's not quite as good as what you get right across the border, but it's, it's okay. Yeah, we, we even went over to Hinkley because I had read a book about the great Hinkley firestorm. I like history. So I read history books and then we go to the places that it happens. <laughs> And that, if you have never been, they have a really nice museum there, and it's a cute little town. And a friend of mine who somebody just moved up there was saying that it gets a lot of like, like really bad weather will miss everybody, but never seems to miss them. So that would be an interesting place to visit. <laughs> when I lived in Moose Lake, Hinkley was just a little south of us, and it's true they had. Um, they had that huge fire. Minnesota's yep. worst natural disaster actually wasn't that fire, though. It was the um, 1918 Moose Lake Cloquet fire. And that took about 450 lives. That's Ooh. an interesting one. Um, there's a book that, um, oh, I just dropped his name. First name is Curtis. He wrote a book about 1918 Minnesota where um, war and the illnesses and then the great fire all came together. Curtis Brown, his name is. Um, and he's got a great book if you like history. Boy, it really goes deep into the, you know, that 1918, probably to 1920, just everything seemed bad to happen. Yeah. I'm just typing that into my phone so I don't forget it. <laughs> yeah. 1918, um, Curtis Brown, really good research book. And then in Moose Lake, they took their depot, um, the train depot, which actually was a refuge for quite a few fire victims. They ended up attacking a train out of there. And they changed the depot into a fire museum, and that's where their historical society is. And in it, they have silverware that was buried underground, you know, because that's what people did. Oh, there's a fire coming, let's hide the silverware. And they put it underground. Well, when the fire came through, it was so hot. It's like a firestorm that there was nothing left. So people didn't realize they couldn't find buried the good silver. Years later, someone was building a house and they'd dig up and there'd be these melted blobs of silverware and things. It was heartbreaking. They're still finding uh -huh. some things. It, it, it really was a crazy year. Um, so what, so you said you have another, what the whole, um, the whole of Minnesota, when, it, when is that coming out, approximately? So all of Minnesota, the first draft is due to the publisher August 1st. Still doing a little bit of research, there's still a couple of ways have to see. Um, it goes to them in August, and my guess is that it'll be out probably February or March. Um, oh. And that will be available, you know, through all the normal distributors. Um, small town books, um, bookstores will have it. The Barnes and Nobles has it. Um, my website will have it. But like I said, it that covers the whole state. So, um, and that one's been a lot more interesting in terms of making sure I'm balancing it. So I took a big piece of cake board and I divided up the fours. And then I drew a little box in the very middle to kind of go for central Minnesota. And I've been just writing things on each section as I've um, gotten referrals from people or places mm -hmm. that I knew I had to put in. Do you use um do you use the book as an excuse to like 
travel all over the place like hey i feel like just going over here and see what seeing what's here <laughs> research yeah, we'll just take that right off the taxes <laughs> yeah yeah i just write it on there i write it on um i have a bracelet and it talks about wonderlust a strong desire to wander or travel and explore the world and that's that's one of those diseases that i have i love to just hop in the car and go yeah so there's two kinds of people when you're traveling. There's the destination person, like my husband, who says, we're going to Thunder Bay, Zoom, we're there. And then there's people that are more about the journey, which is like me. So I'm doing these little side trips, and I'm looking at the Lupine and the Silver Creek Tunnel and learning. And it takes me a lot longer to get played. Um, yeah, I really like the journey. I like to see and uh, understand the history behind what I'm seeing. Yep. Gillette and I are like that. We consider our trip, our our trips, vacations start the minute we get in the car and head out, which is why we leave it like early in the morning to a campsite that's about five hours away and we get there long after dark in July. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah. That, that definitely sounds a lot like what, what I do with my Miss Storians with my girlfriends. We, um, you know, my husband says, what time are you going to be back? And I say, um, before morning, tomorrow. Sometimes we're back at six. Yeah, sometimes it's a lot, lot later. Yeah. Yeah, we'd go from Wadena to where, where do we go? Um, we were going the park camping in the porcupines. Um, so we stopped at Duluth and, you know, or one time she picked me up at the airport and we stopped in Stillwater because there was a really great place with milkshakes and hamburgers. Yes. And, you know, we just take our time and amble up there. And the July one, we had until 10 o'clock at night before it got dark. We got there at one in the morning, <laughs> but we had fun. Oh, and that was probably the one where we had the, the tire blow out on us too. Oh, Okay. Yes. Yeah, I was going to so say, we had the, yeah, the natural extender of your trap. So wow. the tires blowing out, the um, once in a while, map bus doesn't, isn't quite right. So we've ended up in corners that, you know, uh, just aren't quite there. Or there's an address, but the place moved. So we had to get a new one. And, you know, a new address. Yeah. Well, that's what nature find... weekends are for in vacation time. Well, good to see everybody. Yeah.